The apartment was on the top floor. A small living room, a small dining room, a small bedroom, and a bath. The living room was crowded to the doors with a set of tapestried furniture entirely too large for it, so that to move about was to stumble continually over scenes of ladies swinging in the gardens of Versailles. The only picture was an over-enlarged photograph, apparently a hen sitting on a blurred rock. Looked at from a distance, however, the hen resolved itself into a bonnet, and the countenance of a stout old lady beamed into the room. Several old copies of the town tattle lay on the table together with a copy of Simon called Peter, and some of the small scandal magazines of Broadway. Mrs. Wilson was first concerned with the dog. A reluctant elevator boy went for a box full of straw and some milk, to which he added, on his own initiative, a tin of large, hard dog biscuits, one of which decomposed apathetically in a saucer of milk all afternoon. Meanwhile, Tom brought out a bottle of whiskey from a locked bureau drawer. I have been drunk just twice in my life, and the second time was that afternoon, so everything that happened has a dim, hazy cast over it, although until after eight o'clock the apartment was full of cheerful sun. Sitting on Tom's lap, Mrs. Wilson called up several people on the telephone. Then there were no cigarettes, and I went out to buy some at the drugstore on the corner. When I came back, they had disappeared, so I sat down discreetly in the living room and read a chapter of Simon called Peter. Either it was terrible stuff or the whiskey distorted things because it didn't make any sense to me. Just as Tom and Myrtle, after the first drink Mrs. Wilson and I called each other by our first names, reappeared, company commenced to arrive at the apartment door. The sister, Catherine, was a slender, worldly girl of about thirty, with a solid, sticky bob of red hair and a complexion powdered milky white. Her eyebrows had been plucked and then drawn on again at a more rakish angle, but the efforts of nature toward the restoration of the old alignment gave a blurred air to her face. When she moved, there was an incessant clinking as innumerable pottery bracelets jingled up and down her arms. She came in with such proprietary haste and looked around so possessively at the furniture that I wondered if she lived there. But when I asked her, she laughed immoderately repeated my question aloud, and told me that she lived with a girlfriend at a hotel. Mr. McKee was a pale, feminine man from the flat below. He had just shaved, for there was a white spot of lather on his cheekbone, and he was most respectful in his greeting to everyone in the room. He informed me that he was in the artistic game, and I gathered later that he was a photographer, and had made the dim enlargement of Mrs. Wilson's mother, which hovered like an ectoplasm on the wall. His wife was shrill, languid, handsome, and horrible, she told me with pride that her husband had photographed her 127 times since they had been married. Mrs. Wilson had changed her costume some time before and was now attired in an elaborate afternoon dress of cream-colored chiffon, which gave out a continual rustle as she swept about the room. With the influence of the dress, her personality had also undergone a change. The intense vitality that had been so remarkable in the garage was converted into impressive hauteur. Her language, her gestures, her assertions became more violently affected moment by moment, and as she expanded, the room grew smaller around her, until she seemed to be revolving on a noisy, creaking pivot through the smoky air. My dear, she told her sister in a high, mincing shout, these fellows will cheat you every time. All they think of is money. I moved over about a week ago to look at my feet, and when she billed me, you would have swore she had my appendicitis out. What was the name of the woman? Mrs. Everhart. She goes around looking at people's feet in their own homes. I like your dress, remarked Mrs. McKee. I think it's adorable. It's just a crazy old thing, she said. I slip it on sometimes when I don't care what I look like. But it looks wonderful on you, if you know what I mean, pursued Mrs. McKee. If only Chester could get you in this pose, I think he could make something of it. We all looked in silence at Mrs. Wilson, who removed a strand of hair from over her eyes and looked back at us with a brilliant smile. I should change the light, she said after a moment. I'd like to bring out the modeling of the features, and I'd try to get hold of all the back hair. I wouldn't think of changing the light, cried Mrs. McKee. I think it's... You and McKee's have something to drink, Tom said. Get some more ice and mineral water, Myrtle, before everybody goes to sleep. I told that boy about the ice. Myrtle raised her eyebrows in despair at the shiftlessness of the lower orders. These people, you have to keep after them all the time. She looked at me and laughed pointlessly, flounced over to the dog, kissed it with ecstasy, and swept into the kitchen, implying that a dozen chefs were awaiting her orders there. I've done some nice things out on Long Island, asserted Mr. McKee. Tom looked at him blankly. Two of them we have framed downstairs. Two what? Demanded Tom. Two studies. One of them I call Montauk Point, the goals. And the other, Montauk Point, the sea. The sister, Catherine, sat down next to me at the couch. Do you live down on Long Island too? I live at West Day. Really? I was down there at a party about a month ago. I have a name Gatsby's. Do you know him? I live right next door to him. Really? They say he's a cousin or a nephew of Kaiser Wilhelm's. A 
That's where all the money comes from. Really? She nodded. I'm scared of him. I hate her getting anything on me. This absorbing information about my neighbor was interrupted by Mrs. McKee. Chester, I think you could do something with her. Mr. McKee only nodded in a bored way and turned his attention to Tom. I'd like to do some more work on Long Island if I can get the entry. I'll ask instead of giving me the start. Ask Myrtle. Tom said, breaking into a short shout of laughter. <laughs> She'll give you a letter of introduction, won't you, Myrtle? Do what? She asked, startled. You'll give McKee a letter of introduction to your husband so you can do some studies of him. His lips moved silently for a moment as he invented... George B. Wilson at the gasoline pump or something like that. Catherine whispered... Everyone can stand the person they're married to. Can't they? Can't stand them. She looked at Myrtle and then at Tom. What I say is, why go on living with each other if they can't stand the other person? If I was them, I would get a divorce right away and get married to each other. Right away. I mean, doesn't she like Wilson either? The answer to this was unexpected. It came from Myrtle, who had overheard the question, and it was violent and obscene. You see? cried Catherine triumphantly. It's really his wife that's keeping them apart. She's a Catholic and they don't believe in divorce. Daisy was not a Catholic. When they do get married, they're going west to live for a while until this all blows over. There'll be more to street in Europe. Oh, do you like Europe? I just got back from Monte Carlo. Really? Mm-hmm. I went over there with another girl. Stay long? No, we just went to Monte Carlo and back. We went by way of Marseille. We had over $1,200 when we started, but we got Jake out of it all in just two days, in the private rooms. We had an awful time getting back, I can tell you. God, how I hated that town! Then the shrill voice of Mrs. McKee called me back into the room. I almost made that mistake, too, she declared vigorously. I almost married this little kite who'd been after me for years. He was way below me. Everyone said, Lucille, he's way below you. If I hadn't met Chester, I would have married him. Yes, but listen said Myrtle. At least you didn't marry him. I know I didn't. Well, I married him, she said ambiguously. That's the difference between your case and mine. Why did you, Myrtle? Nobody forced you to. Myrtle considered. I married him because I thought he was a gentleman. I thought he knew something about breeding he wasn't fit to lick my shoe. You were crazy about him for a while. Crazy about him? cried Myrtle. I was crazy about him. I was never more crazy about him than I was about that man there. She pointed suddenly at me and everyone looked at me accusingly. The only crazy I was was when I married him. I knew right away I had made a mistake. I borrowed someone's best suit to get married in. And never even told me about it. And the man came after it one day when he was out. Oh, is that your suit? I said. This is the first I have heard about it. I lay down and cried to be fed all afternoon. She really ought to get away from him. He'd been living over that garage for 11 years, and Tom's the first sweetie she's ever had. The bottle of whiskey, a second one, was now in constant demand by all present, excepting Catherine, who felt just as good on nothing at all. Tom rang for the janitor and sent him for some celebrated sandwiches, which were a complete supper in themselves. I wanted to get out and walk eastward toward the park through the soft twilight. But each time I tried to go, I became entangled in some wild, strident argument which pulled me back as if with ropes into my chair. Yet high over the city, our line of yellow windows must have contributed their share of human secrecy to the casual watcher in the darkening streets. And I was him too, looking up and wondering. I was within and without, simultaneously enchanted and repelled by the inexhaustible variety of life. Myrtle pulled her chair close to me, and suddenly her warm breath poured over me the story of her first meeting with Tom. It was on the two little seats facing each other that are always the last ones left on the train. I was going up to New York to see my sister and spend the night. Get in a dress shirt and patent leather shoes and I couldn't take my eyes off of him. Every time he looked at me, I had to pretend to be looking at the advertisement above his head. And when we came to the station, he was next to me with his white shirt front pressed up against my arm and I told him I'd have to call a policeman, but he knew I lied. I was so excited that when I got into a taxi, I hardly knew I wasn't getting into a subway. And all I kept thinking about over and over was, you can't live forever. You can't live forever. My dear, I'm going to give you this dress as soon as I'm done with it. We need to get into town this week and get another one made. I should make a list of all the things I gotta do. I need to get a massage and a wave and call off the dog. And all those little ashtrays where you touch a spring. I can breathe. 
lots of bow on it from Mother's Grave that'll last all summer. I have to make a list of all the things I gotta do so that I don't forget. It was nine o'clock. Almost immediately afterward, I looked at my watch and found that it was ten. Mr. McKee was asleep on a chair with his fists clenched in his lap like a photograph of a man in action. Taking out my handkerchief, I wiped from his cheek the remains of the spot of dried lather that had worried me all afternoon. The little dog was sitting on the table looking with blind eyes through the smoke, and from time to time groaning faintly. People disappeared, reappeared, made plans to go somewhere and then lost each other, searched for each other, found each other a few feet away. Sometime toward midnight, Tom Buchanan and Mrs. Wilson stood face to face, discussing in impassioned voices whether Mrs. Wilson had any right to mention Daisy's name. I told you never to say that! Daisy! Daisy, I'll say whatever I want you! Daisy! Daisy! Then there were bloody towels upon the bathroom floor and women's voices scolding and tie over the confusion a long, broken wail of pain. Mr. McKee woke from his doze and started in a daze toward the door. When he had gone halfway, he turned around and stared at the scene. His wife and Catherine scolding and consoling as they stumbled here and there among the crowded furniture with articles of aid, and the despairing figure on the couch bleeding fluently and trying to spread a copy of Town Tattle over the tapestry scenes of Versailles. Then Mr. McKee turned and continued on his way out the door. Taking my hat from the chandelier, I followed. <laughs> 